Ah, we're excited. It's another Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We always look forward to when we can come together and study the Word of God as an Expresso Faith family. And we just want to thank you for dedicating this time to just partner with us. Please remember, if you um, have any questions, feedback, prayer requests, you can reach out to us at www.espressofaith, that's E-S-P-R-E-S-S-O-F-A-I-T-H at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you and link our faith with yours according to the word of God. And uh, just know that whether it's live or via replay on YouTube, we appreciate you and we pray and cover, for you, cover, um, cover you in prayer. And so we always open um, with a prayer for our Bible study. So if Dad's on the call, I'm going to turn it over to him. Father, we thank you again for the day you've made. We rejoice. We're glad about it. It is in you we live and move and have our being. It is you who has all to do with us, and not just we and our own rationale and our own mindsets and our own perspectives and our own efforts and our own influence that handle the matters that pertain to our lives. It is you who have a glory you intend to get out of us. It is you who have a place for us to be fitted in the body of Christ for the excellency of your glory. And, Father, it is you who have given us this righteousness which qualifies us and allows us to be able to come boldly to the throne of grace to get right up in your face with boldness, with no regard, fear. Father, we are thankful for who we are in Christ Jesus, and we're thankful for this perspective we have on you, and that we can eat of this word, which is like eating your flesh, and where we can believe to receive the righteousness of God, which is by Christ. It's a righteousness which is by the faith of the blood of Jesus. It's like eating your flesh and drinking your blood. It's like hearkening unto you diligently and eating that which is good and letting our souls delight ourselves in fatness. So as we prepare ourselves to go before you again and to share in this word of God, breaking this bread of the word with one another, Father God, let us enjoy. Let us delight ourselves in the fatness of the word because we who are priests, we who are priests unto the Lord, we who are with this royal priesthood, we can eat the fat and we can drink the blood, and we can believe to receive every promise that is in your word. Now give us this treasure, Father God, that goes goes beyond the things that we can accumulate in this world. Give us this true treasure, Father, the true treasure of the revelation of Jesus Christ. We bless you and we praise you and we acknowledge you going forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless me. Thanks, Dad. Uh, I just want to encourage anyone listening, any of the moderators, facilitators, that was some good eating last week, for sure. You know, we always have a really great time in the Word um, week after week. Last week in particular was just, uh, I, I think the way Darnesia had described it, there was no additives, no preservatives, no pesticides on that food. <laughs> it was just straight up. Uh, the gluten-free. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was just. It was farm raised. <laughs> it was excellent eating. And, um, you know, I just encourage you to uh, listen to that again. Get that down in your spirit. It was just a marvelous time we had in the Lord last week. And, um, you know, tonight we believe will be, um, you know, no different. It's always an exchange of power. But um, one of the things that we touched on last week um, was, uh, you know, about murmuring and, you know, a lot of times when we've been caught up in those things in the pit before where you're looking at the situation or looking at the confusion, I encourage you to get a new soundtrack and put the words of Christ, put faith in your mouth, uh, put those marvelous words. I know Darnisha had broke that word marvel down. Those are the things that Jesus marveled at, great faith. And great faith is hinged on the word of God, belief in him. And so those are things that um, we covered stepping into chapter 7 and looking at Jesus and how he flowed in the timing of God, uh, you know, flowed in the timing of God the Father with his assignment at the tabernacle of feast. And, um, you know, the way that we look at how Holy Spirit does this, you know, I like the wording from last week. It was he's an invited guest on this call, and he's an invited guest in our lives, and it shows, and it manifests. And so we're taking this time to study um, the Gospel of John, and I, I was looking at it. The, I mean, it's just been needy. It's been challenging. We're having to really 
um, meditate and chew on it and just allow Holy Spirit to minister to us about the apostle of love. And it's just no, it, it, I don't, it, it's not a mistake that the apostle of love, John, you know, broke down these type of accounts of Jesus. And um, there were things that he brought out and the way that the people responded to Jesus and the confusion and the controversy that occurred, I mean, it bumped up against love. It just showed that sharp contrast, like how people responded to him. And there were um, great claims that Jesus made throughout John 7. And, I, I mean, people struggled with chewing on it. I mean, you kind of heard the, going back to that word, murmuring amongst the cl- uh, crowd and the division. You, I mean, he said, hey, I came down from heaven. Jesus said, you know, made claims to be, I'm the Savior of the world. He made himself equal with God. He said, I'm the source of everlasting life, and I'm the only way. And he began to talk with authority that they had never heard before. We know why, because it was straight from the throne room. He had put the word. He was God and man, and they were struggling with this. They were struggling with, we know where you came from. We know who your mama and daddy is. We know your background, and they um. They, they struggled with believing on him. It was beyond comprehension. It had to be a revelation in your spirit, man, about him. Because we see in John 7, and I'm sure some of you guys are going to bring it up, they were calling him a liar, a blasphemer, a devil, sought to kill him, sought to attack him. And um, we have been walking out this chapter in particular where we see the way Jesus dealt with the crowd. And so was there anything that you wanted to highlight? I want to throw it out to the, um, to the study first. Uh, anything that, you, that kind, of stru- uh, kind of jumped out to you, and we can touch on it, and then I'll go back to some of the points that I had. I'm good for now. Good for now? Uh-huh. Uh-oh, Dad, you laughing. What you got? I'm laughing because I've been enjoying you. Keep it going. Now, well, you know, this is this is what I'll say. Um, I wanted to look at how, like in verse 18 of chapter 7, let me, let's pick up there. It says, well, let's back it up uh, to verse 16. Um, well, the Jews were marveling at what he was saying, and we touched on this last week, and they were checking him, like we're checking his credentials and checking, you know, where, have you, you ain't learned nowhere. You haven't been educated anywhere. Who are you to be speaking with this kind of authority? They hadn't heard this kind of teaching, and we know why. This is teaching that came from heaven. He, supernatural teaching was being downloaded on them. And so verse 16, Jesus answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Verse 17, if any man will do his will, he shall know of this doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness is in him. I want to pause right there for just a moment. Jesus is speaking. He said, when you speak of yourself, you, you speak in your own glory. And I thought about so many times we want to do ministry, we want to step out, we want to get in the pulpits, we want to, I'm in the fourfold, fivefold, whatever it is, the fold, ministries. And, you know, Jesus is saying here, your teaching got to come from heaven. It's got to be his will. And then secondly, it's got to bring him glory. It's not about you. It's about him. And I think real sim- with, with, to simplicity, Jesus just put a bow on a whole lot of things that would disqualify a whole lot of people from talking, from opening their mouth, from feeling like they are imparting into somebody. If you are not bringing him glory, this is a, this is a, a checkmate here. If it ain't from him, what you talking about? If it ain't bringing him glory, what, what you talking about? And I'm just repeating what Jesus said. And so I thought that I highlighted that piece because I thought it was very good for those who are interested in going into ministry and, and, and asking, Lord, use me, enlarge my tent. Okay, are you doing this now? <laughs> are, you, are you speaking what he's speaking? Are you bringing him glory? And you can always tell 
and he just and he just mm-hmm. mentioned he just broke it down right there, and then um, he goes on to deal with he started checking them. Why are you trying to kill me? Y'all the ones mm-hmm. ain't keeping the law. Is that not what Jesus? Let me tell you something. I could have went out and hung with Jesus for real back in the day. He said, mm-hmm. "Did not verse nineteen? Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you kept it?" Why are you go about to kill me? That's what he was saying. Like, why are you why are you coming for me, though? That's what he said. <laughs> why mm-hmm. are you coming for me when you're the one that's breaking the law? And what's interesting is they couldn't touch him on anything. So they started going after his credentials and his background. That's the other mm-hmm. part I noticed, that when you can't touch, can't touch the truth, can't touch it. You, you're just sitting there. He just broke it down, laid, dropped the mic on him, and then they start trying to attack his background, attack, you know, his credentials. And, and he's like, you know, wave them on, Wanda, like, no. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's not going to even fly. You heard me, and you're accountable to what you heard. And so I just um, – those are the things that kind of resonated within me. I just saw so much crazy division and, you know, not to just kind of skip ahead, but I always wondered, all these multitudes of people that follow Jesus, why was it only like a handful of folks in the upper room, you know? <laughs> and a whole lot of people just sit like, out. started, g- g- come on now, fell away after the, after they didn't, he didn't meet the expectation that he started, they didn't want to go 100 they want to be on the fence, so they didn't believe on him. And remember, he, Jesus said in some of the chapters we studied earlier here in John, he said, I knew what was in man. I, he withdrew from certain people because he knew they weren't with him. And so I just, um, I thought that was interesting. What was it, 120 in the upper room? 120 folks, but he had multitudes, multitudes of people that he ministered to. And that's it? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Short list. What? This is short list. RSVP. <laughs> RSVP. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, that, yeah, is there anything else that um that tied that you guys uh that jumped out to you guys? I thought um I, I put it out there and now I'm like got something else on me. But did you see the parts where Jesus cried out? Yes. Oh, like verse mm-hmm. twenty eight. Then cried Jesus and he cried out. He cried like the emotion, like why are they not listening? Arr. Like that's what I got from it. Just the that humanity piece. I don't think that word is a mistake, that he cried out. Mm-hmm. Cried out. A, like a sense of urgency is behind that emotion. Like, hear me. I don't want you to be lost. And um yeah. So I was wondering. Uh oh, right, did we lose you? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. I was looking at the fact that he um he referenced Moses several times. Mm-hmm. Why do you all think that? Why do you Why do you all think he 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 uh he uh brought Moses into the mix? Well, my my first and most most immediate reaction is that. Because that was uh, who they were about. They were about Moses and the law and, and, and being law. Uh, so mm-hmm. Abraham's over Abraham's uh, Abraham's seed and uh, the natural progression. And obviously, I'm thinking about Galatians now. You know, there's passages in Galatians. I believe Galatians three, where it says the law was given. No, well, that's in Saint John. Actually, the law was given by Moses, but grace to came Jesus Christ. They were not aware that Jesus was bringing a new, what they might call a dispensation, a new dispensation, a new way of doing things. And uh, they were still under Mosaic law, 600 and something, what, statutes and ordinances and commandments and precepts and exhortations and testimonies and judgments. And they was all about doing and thou shalt not. And uh, let me pick up my rock in case I can, you know, get an opportunity to be a judge, somebody, judge somebody else for, for not following through what I know I haven't followed through on either. And so, you know, he was – he was dealing with them based on the system that they dealt with. They dealt with Moses' system. And uh, I think that what he was re- actually doing was saying, well, Moses basically points to me. There is a scripture in Galatians 3, and it says something like this. It says, or chapter, it says, I made a, well, I'll say my own words. It says, I made a covenant with a man named Abraham. It says, uh, to those who believe, who does Abraham, they are, the, they are the children of God. It says, those who are of faith are blessed with faith by Abraham. This is the third chapter of the book of Galatians. And then it says something like this. 
It says, so God made a deal with Abraham, and no man can strike the deal he made with Abraham. It was, and theology, theology calls it the promise, the dispensation of promise. And then he says, the law came 430 years after Abraham. And then, you know, this is on the other mm-hmm. side, New Testament, Galatians. Uh, John, uh, the writer of Galatians, he's saying the, the, real, it's, the real deal is this, is that God made a deal, a covenant with Abraham. He confirmed it. He confirmed it in the 15th chapter of the book of Genesis when he accepted Abraham's sacrifices, so on and so forth. And then God allowed Moses to bring the law, the law given by Moses. And then he said the law came 430 years after. And then I want to say it like this. 2,000 years later, here comes Christ. So I want to say Adam to Abraham, 2,000 years, 2,000 years from, Ad, from Abraham to Christ. And then and, and 430 years after God's deal with, with, um, with Abraham, he got the law. So he got the law for almost 2,000 years. We'll say 1,500, 1,600 years. And he's saying mm-hmm. he's got to deal with them based on what they've had for 1,600 years. And what he's actually mm-hmm. trying to do, well, and Paul says it very plainly, uh, he says, you know, the law which came 430 years after Abraham, God's dealing with mm-hmm. man by instituting a law, it does not break the deal that God made with Abraham. And then in the last part of Galatians 3, he says, and we are tied to that one seed of that covenant, which is Christ. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed, the heirs according to the promise. So he dealt with the law because that's what they was dealing with. That's what they were immersed in. Mm-hmm. That's what they believed in. That's what they knew. Mm-hmm. And he had to show that law points to me. That law points to me. Yeah, I um, I, I was reading a, a commentary, Ellicott's commentary, and um, he was basically, it was basically saying that um, that Moses had given um, circumcision not not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And it's also saying that they circumcised um, as part of the Mosaic law, but Moses gave them circumcision because he had an interior and higher authority for it. And so in practice, they overrode the Sabbath, Sabbath and recognized it somehow because of Moses, the circumcision on the Sabbath. So they basically, what I could gather is that somehow they overrode you know, you know, recognizing it, you know, on the Sabbath, and for for that reason, they did it because Moses said so, and he like, well, why y'all why y'all giving me a hard time? They they giving him a hard time because he said he the God of the Sabbath, <laughs> right? He, right. He well, I'm just saying he's Sabbath. making that point. Yep. He's making that mm-hmm. point like you overrode for Moses, right? That's, good. <clears throat> That's a very good point. That's very good. Actually. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, you're not supposed to be doing nothing on Sabbath, but here is something right. that Moses is doing, and he did it on the Sabbath. And the fact of yeah. the matter is that what Moses is doing, he got from God. Mm-hmm. He got circumcision mm-hmm. from God, yet, yet mm-hmm. he contradicts supposedly what came down from Sabbath. You know, another thing that parallels that is what Jesus said, I believe it's in the 19th chapter of the book of Matthew. He said to uh, those who were inquiring about marriage, and he said, uh, uh, God's original intent of marriage was that one man with one woman. Uh, you leave your parents mm-hmm. and you one man with one woman. But then he said this. He said, because of your, I want to call it stiffness of heart, your, your improper impropriety of heart, um, what Moses did is he allowed you to write a, a, a writ of divorcement. You know, but, but he did it because of, your, of your, the obstinance of your own heart, the rebelliousness of your heart, you know, the, the self-centered desires that you wanted to get a younger woman or another woman or to be able to go through women for that matter. And so two mm-hmm. things I get from that is that in general, God got, Moses got what he got from God. And mm-hmm. but Moses was also the authority. Just as mm-hmm. those Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and Herodians, they were the authority, the Sanhedrin. And you could make yeah. other laws because you were the authority. So Moses mm-hmm. actually allowed them to have a law of divorce, but that was not God's original intent. So mm-hmm. what that tells me is that even today, you know, as we make decisions about right and wrong or as we rule and circumstances that we encounter where there's a conflict or differences of opinion in church, we're going to make determinations. We're going to make judgments. And what we want to do is make sure our heart is clean with the judgment that we make and that it's consistent with the righteousness that we understand that God would do, you know, the righteousness which is of the heart. So and I, I just find that that's, that, that, that's interesting. 
Very That's interesting. Good. And and it's a and and it's about following God, hearing from God. Yes. You know, like you have yes. you have to hear from God yourself. You have yes. you have the written word and and there are certain situations and circumstances you have to hear from God yourself and know what to yes. do. Yes. Right. Yes. Because yes. we're under grace. We're under grace, yes. we're not under the law. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The factor mm-hmm. in that whole grace thing, that whole grace thing means you need to be talking to God constantly. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, yes, yes, the Bible, yes, but you still need to be hearing from Holy Spirit. You need to be hearing, you be talking to God constantly. Mm-hmm. I like that. In other words, the Bible you know, God, but God can get you a word by virtue of Holy Spirit. I'm gonna mm-hmm. go a step further. I was I ran into someone um, earlier today, and we were having a very powerful exchange while I was at work, and. There was we were talking about the very thing you just brought up, um, Sherry, about you got to hear from God. And I said, how about the nonverbals? Have you ever like my mother and I have, and and you know I do this with Sherry too, but Sherry lives in another state. But particularly with my mother and I, we could just look at each other and we just know. You a full story in one look, and it's just nothing was said. You just know her. I know her, she knows me. We just know each other because of the time that we've spent together in our relationship. It's the same thing between husbands and wives. They know each other. They're one flesh when they're supposed to. And with the Father, we're in him, he's in us, we're one flesh. There are things that you'll be walking and it's a knowing. You people are looking for like super audible booming voice. This is what I want you to do, and you'll just have a knowing. It's, it'll be a nonverbal ping, like a a little implosion of revelation of what to do or what not to do. He leads you by your spirit, and we just don't need to box him in with it. It's not just the word, but it's it's your spirit, man. You have to know. You will know him. Yeah, and I, I was thinking, I, absolutely, and I was thinking about, um, I heard my former pastor say this a long time ago, um, probably almost 15 years ago. He he was saying that I could be in a crowded stadium yeah, and I would hear my wife's voice. Mm-hmm. In, in that stadium, and he, I mean, he was driving home the point of intimacy, and it, I was with some, some friends this weekend, and um, I was sitting next to one, one of the ladies, and her mom was on the other side of the room, and she said, I can hear my mom's voice. <laughs> and yep, so, that's exactly what we brought up earlier. Do you write on it? Mm-hmm. Yep, and so it, it is, it is, it is like that where you, you can hear from God for yourself. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not, we've talked about it before, it's not negating prayer, is not negating the, the, the power of agreement and, and things like that. But ultimately, um, you know, even in my interactions with counseling and stuff like that, I never, you, I, I get people to worry and then they have to decide, they have to make that decision Come on. for themselves. They have to, they have to hear from God, period. And that, yeah, the scripture tells us that we know his voice and we don't follow strangers. We know his voice. There's, a, there's an increased sensitivity that comes from spending time with the Lord. And I know Sherry has talked about this at great length in the past, and I don't know if she wants to put any more meat on the bones or even reiterate because I don't want to misquote you, but speak it in other tongues increases that sensitivity. That frequency, you just tune in without any, if I could say it this way, there isn't any interception. It's you and God. And that helps you have that increased sensitivity, be able to pick up that frequency, pick up that voice. You pick it up. And there are some instances when you, you can't run and grab the word. It's got to be in you. You know, if we, we talked about this before, when you go on to see your doctor, it's not very, I'm not very confident when you're running your fingers through the manual trying to figure out how to do a procedure. I need you to know. And there are, there are instances where you're going to be in situations where you're going to have to pull on that knower, Holy Ghost. And 
the way that that gets sharpened and tuned in. And, and it's not just even for everyday li- living. It's just even what was going on in this time we're studying with John 7, people were confused. They really did not understand or believe on him. They were struggling. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, Sadducees, whatever, they were stirring controversy, what people were believing, uh, the, the, that whole familiar spirit. There was so much confusion and controversy about who Jesus was. And Jesus himself was clear about who he was. And they struggled with it. And if there's going to be times where you're sitting somewhere, you need to be able to fix yourself right in on, okay, I hear what somebody is saying. What do they say about Jesus? What do they believe about Jesus? And start from that point and break out. Whenever I'm dealing with people who, you know, have other doctrines or mixing up stuff or you or they are of of other faiths, I listen, what do you say about Jesus? And I start from that point. And I don't know if anyone else has something they wanted to tack on to that, but I just looked at how Jesus was just, he didn't water the word of truth down. He didn't make it, what's my word, palatable. He didn't make it where they could digest it and go, oh, well, I'll say it this way and, and, and eliminate this. No, he went right down the middle, blunt, direct truth. He was loyal to the word of truth, and he did not turn from it. I wonder in the uh, 27th verse, you know, like you said, they were confused. Um, I'll, maybe I won't say, yeah, I guess it was a confusion, but, again, you know, you want to do what you're comfortable doing. What they were comfortable doing was this religious thing they did relative to the laws of Moses. Yep. And uh, in the 26th verse, it says, But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. So the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ. So I take this as the people checking out. We found the man, verses 25, before that it says, Then said some of them in Jerusalem, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? People in that temple at that feast knew they were after Jesus to kill him. Jewelry, the leadership. And, um, and then they, they, you know, it's almost, to me it's like the people are saying, or there's a realization that he's speaking boldly. Why don't, why don't the leaders arrest him? Do, do, the, do the leaders, do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? Is that why they want to arrest him? And in 27, how be it we know this man whence he is? But when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. And I'm just wondering. You know, and it just dawned on me. I haven't done, you know, an investigation of this verse, but is that what was said? That when Christ comes, no man knoweth whence he is? Is that what was said in the Old Testament? I mean, you know, Isaiah said some things about, you know, when he's coming, he's going to be this and this, and the government's going to be upon his shoulders. Okay, we got prophecies as, as to, you know, Jesus' birth and Jesus' is, you know, having to escape from Herod's trying to kill him. We got various prophecies, but is there a prophecy? And I don't even know if I'm phrasing the question correctly, but you know, is there a prophecy that says that when Jesus comes, no man knoweth whence he is? Oh. I'm going to tell you where that's coming from there. Remember when you brought up that question about water and blood? About the, um, and and we, you really did an excellent job breaking down the Levitical priesthood. But you remember when I was going into, what was it, First John? And I said that, that, that John, the Apostle John, was battling people um spreading heresy saying that he was he, he was gonna just appear suddenly. He wasn't going to be born. Remember that? And so people oh. were struggling even with that piece. I just kinda when I was studying this out and I looked and I said, That's that same thread from first John and I can go over there. Let, let, mm-hmm. let's, let's let's look at that. I wanna see that. You're saying that there was a thing <laughs> that he wouldn't be Born, he just appeared. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Suddenly. Let me, well, show me that. I need to see that. Okay. Well, let's go over to, um, well, we're going to do it live because I typically would have uh, would have studied this out on my own. But where was the yeah, scripture when we started that before? First John, where is it, First John? I always thought the prophecy was, was real deceit that he's going to be born. Mm-mm. Yeah. No, it was some it was some clowns that were talking about um they were in the spirit of error, talking about he's just going to appear. 
And you know, um, yeah, what, no man knows what he is. Go ahead. Right. Yeah, I just got to, I may have to, I have to study it. Hang on, let me find it. Because we were in First John chapter 5 when we were discussing water and blood. And he, remember when we talked about this, this is not the first time we were talking about it, but he was dealing with people who were saying, no, he was supposed that he's not to be born, he would just appear suddenly. No, I don't remember that at all. Okay, so, well, I have to find we'll it. We'll discuss another time. Mm-hmm. We'll discuss another time, but, you know. Okay, well, I'm on the call if I, if I, for many deceivers are in a who could. Okay, here it is. Well, this is part, this is part of it. This is not all of it. In Second John. First oh, seven. Okay. Well, second. But remember, we started off in First John, but there was a part in Second John. I'm just looking at it right now, y'all. I'm just studying it while I'm on the phone. In Second John, uh, verse seven, it says, "For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and antichrist." Wow. Um, let me see. Wow. So, yeah, so look at Amplify. So many imposters have gone out into the world, deceivers, seducers, false leaders, men who will not acknowledge the coming of Jesus Christ in bodily form, such a one is an imposter, blah, 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 blah. But there was another very clear scripture that was oh, tying Lord back Lord to Lord people. Lord now. It's first John Where? 4. It's first John okay. 4. Let me the see. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because any false prophets and guns in the world, everybody knows your spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that will not confess, that confesses not that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh, is not of God. You know what? As many times as I've seen that scripture, I still didn't see it like I see it now as perhaps a religion or a doctrine you know, or, or, or an expectation. You know, if you don't expect him to come in the flesh, that means he can just appear or he's not to be born. I had never thought of it that way. Yeah, it's. There is, I, I just got to kind of pull it together and I can do it for next week because I've seen it more than one time, but I need to do a study on where people got that. From. You know, people get off on, on things real quick, just like people say you ain't saved if you ain't been dumped in some water. It's like, really? But that dude was hanging on the cross next to Jesus, and Jesus said he's going to be in paradise with him, blink, yes. blink. Yes. I just sit yes. there and stare at, like, where you get that from, dog? Where your Bible, where your word at? And so it's the same thing. People were saying things, and John was dealing with it. Like, they believed he would just appear. And so Another there word. was something yes. that they were lifting out of context in the law about it. He would appear, just appear physically, like appear. Yeah, yeah. You know, that, that's really outstanding in my, in my opinion because, um, you know, like Sherry said, you know, the Old Testament, the law does say he should be born of a virgin. Nevertheless, and that means born, okay? Nevertheless, I can mm-hmm. see somebody else coming up with a doctrine, you know, a religious uh, perspective that says, if we know where your mom and your daddy yet, you can't be the Christ. You can't be the Messiah. You can't be the one. I can, mm-hmm. I can, and that's what they did say. We know your mom and your daddy. We know you got brothers and sisters over here. We know you. We're going to go get your cousins because you're acting crazy, casting out devils. Good. Okay. All right, I learned something. Yeah, but let me, yeah, but let me just for this study and for anyone listening to, I'm telling you, let me study that out and get back next week on that because there's a whole, I want to get to the root of where people lifted that out of context. Um, and, and, and John clearly, it, it talks about him dealing with these, um, you know, heretical points of views and people saying that yes. wasn't Christ because this is how it's supposed to be. He like, look, no. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was dealing with it. But that's what you hear that same sentiment here at the Tabernacle of Feast. That yes. whole you, you smell it. People still talk, they talking about it. He's supposed to come a different way. They looking for him a different way. Yeah, when Christ comes, both Interesting. Know it, when he comes. All right, we went off a little bit, but it was still on subject. It was a different book. That's good. I see that. Yeah. And um, I think it ties into ver- verse 24, where he says, judge not a- according to the, the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You know, like, yeah. look at my fruit. Uh. Look, at, look, what I, look what I'm producing. But I know it doesn't necessarily tie into the born part, but I just wanted to, to, like, just highlight that. Because it's just like, he is, again, he was just battling. He beating, like... I did one thing, and y'all tripping on me. 
I heard yes. one thing on the Sabbath. Yes. And now, so and now I'm in trouble. You know, here's you the know? other thing, Dionysia. You know, Jesus suggests that if you know my father or if you're seeking truth or you're not representing yourself, then you'll be able to know um, the truth of the person that I am. Then you'll be able to recognize truth. You know, and so he really indicates something of the heart. You know, if you're settling with religion, if you're settling with status quo, if you're settling with the merchandising that was going on back then, because they were merchandising, they were merchandising with their religion, and the religious leaders were receiving bounty, all right, for their positions. And so, you know, but he's saying, if, you know, if, if your heart was right, is what I'm really getting, if your heart was really right, you, you know who I am. You know, you know that, I don't, that, that those who represent the truth would not represent themselves, and I don't come in myself. And I just think about the scripture that's in Second Peter, the first chapter, and and then, well, and, and then the scripture in Hebrews, I believe it's eight chapter, and it talks about a conscience, you know, having a good conscience. What are your motives, you know? And the mm-hmm. fact that the blood of Jesus purges our conscience. And then in Second Peter, he says it like this. He says it like this. He says, in so many ways, he says, if your heart is what it's supposed to be, there's no oh. way you're not gonna have a revelation of Jesus. There's no Come way. Come on. Yeah. And then, in, and then mm-hmm. again, in Second Peter one, he says, "I'm going to give you this measure of faith." That's in Corinthians. He says, "But if you will add to your faith virtue, knowledge, patience, temperance, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity, if you will allow your heart to be a heart of charity, you will in no wise be barren or ignorant in the knowledge." He's talking about epignosis, revelation knowledge of Jesus, because you can intellectualize, you can rationalize, you can create schema, you can talk philosophically, you can do all you want. And all you try, with all your effort, with all your intellectual might, and you can't, you won't know God unless he reveals himself to you. And so, mm. uh, yeah, it's almost like you don't know me, but you say that you, yeah. uh, you know, you're this and that, and you've been involved in this for how many years, and you're the priest, you're this. You don't know me? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, that's what he said. Don't. And then um, he hit wanna... it in verse 29. Uh-huh, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, D. No, I just, no, he just said, um, I know him, and he's yelling at this point. He's crying out. Yeah. I know him. I'm from him. He sent me. Like, yeah. it's me. I'm the, I'm the one. Ain't nobody yeah, else coming behind. I just me. Yeah. But, but if you look at um, verse, uh, verse 30, and we talked about, the, you know, the timing the last week, and he, yeah. nobody put their hands on him, though. Yes. Nobody. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. So that, that assures us nope. we're speaking the word of God and we're representing the kingdom of God and we got some issues to deal with or some opposition. Uh, we, we don't need to fear. You know, God's got a great yeah. track record. He knows how to yep. confuse it. Fear no nothing. Problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Fear mm-hmm. nothing. And it gives us the liberty to, to go and to travel and to move and to navigate. And it's yeah. and we talked about it probably last year about you know you may not go the same route home, yeah. but you be spirit led <laughs> to know on, which now. route to go, where to go, yeah. how to go. Hallelujah. But it's all about about him, you knowing him, and you being a representation of Christ. And so even when you yeah. are sharing the gospel with people, they not rejecting you; they rejecting the word. Yes. Come on. And you just you know, can't I, can't get offended by it. Yeah. If I may, and I, if I may, I know we run out of time. If I may, two things, two things. Just uh, I was with my wonderful senior citizens earlier, and uh, we were talking about some of the things we talk about here, and uh, I came across the scripture John six thirty five. And it says, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And one of our conclusions the other day was, how do you drink his blood? By believing unto righteousness, by believing unto the righteousness, which is by faith in his blood. And I looked at this latter part of this verse as confirmation for that. Believe is to mm-hmm. drink, and if you drink, you won't be thirsty. Do you see that? Believe it on me to never thirst. And then, it, and then it, it comes to mind again because in 7, was it 738? Yeah, 738. He's saying, believing, I'm going to say, drinking blood. And I ain't talking about cannibalism, okay? And he says, Yikes. believing, believing on me. As the scriptures have said, out of your belly will flow rivers of living yeah. water. 
you know. So, I mean, it's Jesus be talking this stuff, I'm telling you. I, let me tell you something. We were, we were discussing that part, too. You have to, you have to come as um, a child. Jesus talked about that. Let, you know, you've got to come with childlike faith. You know, they don't have a lot of hang-ups when they're believing things. It's just a simplicity. There's an easy, there's a I trust you, and yay, Lord, let's go. Like children just go. They're led. And the Lord says, you got to come to me like that. These adults that we're seeing at this feast, they have so many hang-ups, so, many, so much stuff need to be reprogrammed and thrown out. And, you know, they, when you tell a child, drink this, they're going to drink it. Eat this. They're going to eat it. You know what I mean? They're going to not, what is it? What you mean by this, Lord? What? No, they just, they, they're sponges. They soak it up. And, and, they, and they trust. They, they, have a, they have a trusting nature already kind of tied into them. And they, he said, come with that childlike faith. Um, eliminate all the hang-ups and surrender. And just come to me. And I, and I think that's good. Um, they, they struggled. And you see it right here. Um, I actually took a little bit of time, Dad. I don't know if you want to make your other point, but I um, I did find the scriptures in the Old Testament where some people believe where Jesus would appear suddenly. And I know we're about to run out of time, so I'm going to give the scripture references for them. We can still study it out. Anyone who's listening, study it out, look at it. But it's in Isaiah 53, 8 and Malachi 3, 1. I'll read Malachi first, and it's another one in Daniel 7 and 13. But Malachi 3.1 says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So they're, they're, they're looking for somebody to suddenly show up in the, in the temple. And then in Isaiah 53, 8, if you, uh, if you back it up to verse 4, clearly they're talking about the Messiah. Surely he shall, you know, he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. It goes on, on to talk about wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. They're talking about Jesus. So they're going on, and then verse 8, it says, he was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? So people lifted that piece saying, no one can lay claim to his generation because he doesn't have a genealogy. He just appeared. <laughs> he's just suddenly. So that's why he's like after the order of Melchizedek, who has no so right. and so forth. Yes. Did that's it? Good. That's where people did not take the counsel of the word of God, take the get it. And so that piece right there is worthy of a study, but you – it's very interesting, Dad, that you were able to pick that up. I underlined it, but you're right. They're like, you, you ain't even spoke. They were questioning him. I don't want to misinterpret. Where, where is the scripture at in John? Read it again, Dad. Where is it at? John 7, verse, oh, verse 27. Yeah. Yeah, 27. They said, when the Christ arrives, no one is to know from what place he comes. Like, we're not supposed right. to know where he's coming from. It's supposed to be suddenly. That's what they meant by that. Some meant by that. That's good. Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. And John was battling those people as well in, in First John. You see that, that heresy coming up again. Hmm. That's good. All mine settled. It looks like we, we kind of flowed through John 7 pretty good, and we can, we can touch and make sure we give time for anything else that maybe springs up, and we're ready to move into John 8 next week. Sounds good. Um, excellent. Nice. Thank you. Um, Sherry's okay, closing out say prayer something to... real quick. Yeah, I'll pray. That's fine. I okay. think one other thing that this this grouping of verses is bringing attention to that's kind of like an undertone, it's the urgency that? that they brought to dealing with false prophets. Like, yeah. It was yeah. A very, there was an urgency to it. Like, hey, false teaching. if he's wrong, then he's leading our entire our entire camp down the wrong path and turning the things of God. And so there's a, mm-hmm. there's an urgency to dealing with false prophets. It's an urgency that we don't have now. We just let go up really quickly. Sure, don't make me take my Bible and toss it. Uh, it's the truth. We, we talk really about the Lord and 
No one checks it. No one calls it on the carpet. Oh, we're being yeah. nice. Everybody has to have a view. We have to have tolerance. <laughs> Forget tolerance. You know, they talking against what you know to be the truth. They don't right. want to know. You know, it's just but it's just been so downplayed, and I believe that is the undertone of that. Those scriptures are bringing attention to such urgency they had. And hey, if he lying, we need to deal with this liar. Throw some stones at this joker. My mom. But he won't lie. He won't lie, though. Yeah, that's that's he good. It goes back to that whole <laughs> ministers of the gospel not feeling pressure to water stuff down, to you know, make stuff, like we said, palatable. That's the same. How about just not lying, period? How about that? I'm going to call it on the carpet the way that it is. How about just not telling a lie? You need to keep it to what we said in the beginning. Your teachings must come from heaven. It must be his will and bring him glory. Those are Jesus' words. You, you know, How about that? here's the other thing. We, 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 may, we may discuss this sometime, but you know, like on your talk shows, and even when you're out dealing in the public or dealing with institutions, whether it's schools or governments, and people have requirements, and one of the requirements is to make yeah. a difference between stuff that's supposed to be religious or sounds religious, and you should not be um, infringing upon the rights of others who may have other points of view. And you can't say these things uh, to our children because they're still defining themselves, whether they're going to be boys or girls or this and that. You know, Boom. there is a wisdom. There is a wisdom to dealing in these various spheres. And like Sherry yeah. says, you know, be prepared with truth and be prepared to be bold but also be wise because one of the easiest things to do, you know, is, is one, of the, one of the most frequent things we see is people being declared, you know, crazy religious nuts and fanatics. You know, I want you, and, and I think that this is what Jesus was. He wants us to deal with whom we have to deal with, with wisdom, with knowledge, I mean, outclassing them, taking their questions, giving yeah. their questions back to them by the Holy Ghost. And uh, helping them to see that, hey, you know, I need to come from a different angle. And a lot of times it just comes with framing a thing, framing a thing in mm-hmm. a way that truth mm-hmm. is manifest. You haven't acted unseemly. You haven't allowed them to pull you into it. And you haven't, and you, haven't you know, Joan of Arc, I will die for the gospel while my mm-hmm. is foolishness. And I can be, you know, described mm-hmm. as such on a 6 o'clock news, you know. So oh. there is a real thing to be learned and a real wisdom, and I, I, I'm, I'm saying a manner to be learned when you're dealing in these, in these various spheres and representing the truth, not denying the truth that we know. I mean, we love the homosexual. Jesus died for the homosexual and any other kind of uh, aberration or orientation you want to talk about. He died for you. He loves you. I'm going to love you too. However, do you want to know the truth of what Jesus says about this? It is an abomination, certain, certain of these things, which you wish which you wish to legislate, which you wish to have a right to do, and obviously you got a choice, and the ultimate judge is he who is the judge of all. And the Bible indicates in Revelation that he's going to judge everything. But, um, you know, and I, and I heard a pastor say, my pastor, as a matter of fact, he says, you're going to make your choice, but don't limit mm-hmm. my ability. Don't sequester me. Don't make a law that I can't preach this gospel, because when I preach this gospel, right. you're going to get the whole truth and be able to make the best decision. Yeah. And it's not it's not because of a lack of information and, and uh, what what I was thinking about with, uh, was Romans one twenty eight. So it's interesting that you brought that up, but um, that one Romans one twenty eight specifically says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those mm-hmm. things which are not convenient. And then, you know, that, mm. that scripture is sandwiched with a whole bunch of other stuff. But um, mm. our responsibility is to share the gospel, is to give the information, and people have a will. They have a will to do with, with that information. And uh, we know that yeah. one plants, one seeds, another comes along in water. And so we yep. just do our part. We do our part. Mm-hmm. I love that you, you said it like you made it real plain, D. I was talking earlier this morning with someone. If people understood that ministry is really, it starts with the person in front of you, okay? It's, it's, you're ministering to the person in front of you. And the, and the Lord, I, I, one of the things that I do when I wake up, Lord, that a heart is prepared that comes across my path today, a prepared heart. 
Not somebody, I didn't see Jesus going into, I mean, he got with him sometimes, but I didn't see in this tabernacle a feast where he was like going into an all-out battleground debate with people and like you, you got to, like it starts turning into something else. The anger that they have for him, I didn't see that same thing spewed out on them. I didn't see that. He stood on the side of truth and didn't move from it. And he used wisdom with when he got bold, when he pulled back. And there are things, we talk about this, people, they, you have to use wisdom when you're on your workplaces, wisdom with sharing this gospel, and the Lord will give you an entrance. He knows the key that will unlock. And you don't know if you're on the watering in or the planting seed in when you're dealing with people. And you just, just need to be led. And so I don't know if anyone has something to add on that piece. I just, I love learning about how Jesus taught and ministered and dealt with his enemies, dealt with the disciples and those who followed him. I love to see how he operated in wisdom with these different, with people, with people, period. Absolutely. Yeah. You're out of time. Anything else? Yeah, we are out of time. I don't know if anyone had anything closing, but other than that, Sherry, you got it. Uh oh, Sherry. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank and praise you for bringing us together. Lord, we just thank you that you bring people across our path that we can be a blessing to, and you can they can be a blessing yeah. to us. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God that went forth, that it is nourishment to our spirits, God, and in turn that nourishment to our spirits feeds our bodies as well, God. Lord, we just thank you that the prayer request that you placed for for us uh, today regarding healing in people's bodies. We already know that you've already healed us because you died on the cross, God. The word tells us that, that by your Uh-oh, we may have lost Sherry. Hello? Uh-oh. Lift up Mary before you in the name of Jesus. I pray right now for her healing. I pray for Ms. Deborah's pastor, that she be healed and hold as well. I pray for Sharika, God, that her body be healed as well, God. I thank you right now, God, that there's no fear as they walk through their journey of healing manifesting in their bodies, God, that there be no fear and let them operate in a divine state of healing and wholeness. Lord, we just thank and praise you for Regina. Keep her safe, God. Keep her healed and whole. Keep everyone safe and healed, God, as we go from this week to next week, God. Lord, let us have peaceful weeks. Continue to send people to us, God, that we can open up their, the, the light of hope for them, God. Let our lives be that light that shines. Let, let them just notice just something different that gives them a, a spark that says, hey, what's different about them? I need to know what they have that I don't have that makes them shine so bright. And we know it's your yeah. glory on the inside shining on the outside. We thank you, God, that your ministry is still going strong, the ministry of hope, the ministry of love, the ministry of salvation. Still going strong. And we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Excellent. I just um, am excited about. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Oh, really? Yeah, you had dropped off for a little bit there. But that's okay. You still got the prayer out. Um, There was, um, you know, this is what I'll say. It has been a blessing to study the word of God with um, this body of believers. I am excited about the ministers and the leaders um, that are being raised up who are committed to teaching Christ's words and bringing him glory. And I just um, want you to know, uh, you know, we are praying for each and every uh, person. We call your names out. We call the listeners out. And we just believe that the Lord is just doing a very a mighty work in and through us in this season, that we just continue uh, meditating and feasting and just drawing to he's got so much to say to us. And we cannot, you know, just do a quick drive-by, fly-by. We have to carve that time, quality time, and just love on him and just let him minister to us and just 
just whisper things to us, speak to us about our future and the things that he's already ordained before the foundation of the world. He wants us walking in those things. He wants to bring us in connection, in relationships. Those things are being made manifest right now. I know it's happening. And so we have been praying. We've already seen just, you know, just the difference in the way that we've been studying this word together as a Bible study. We've come in unity. We made a commitment as a Bible study to, you know, allow Holy Spirit to have his way, and there is a change, and we can see it, and um, we can see it even in our individual lives. And so, you know, anyone who's listening, know that we love you. We pray for you. We are believing, God, that you'll have an incredible week, that His uh, there will be an exchange of power even to you as well, and that bountiful praise reports and blessings will, will spring forth as a result. We love you. Have an incredible evening and week. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night.